weeks. Amen. Let's give a hand to my beautiful wife again. Praise Jesus. Hallelujah. Now, before I jump into the Word of God, this is the moment that we want to give you an opportunity to bring God your first. Open with me in Proverbs. I know the uh, projection team, I didn't prepare you guys, so it's Proverbs 11. Uh, Proverbs is the second uh, easiest book to open your Bible. Psalm is the easiest. You're just opening the half of your Bible in the very middle. And Proverbs is right after Psalms. Psalms, I'm sorry, Proverbs chapter 11. And we're going to read verse 24 and 25. Proverbs 11, verse 24 and 25. I, I like sometimes to catch you guys in surprise so you can actually follow up with me. So Proverbs 11, 24 and 25. Look what it says. One gives freely, yet grows all richer. Say amen. So the, the, it's very clear. When you give freely, when you are free from attachment to stuff, to things, to money, to the riches, you grow more rich. It's not me saying, it's the Word of God. But another withholds what he should give. Say with me, he or she should give. So you know there are this, this desire to give, this calling to give. January is a special month for us. Because it's the month that we bring our first fruits. It's when we know we should give God first. So I want to encourage you to learn this principle this year. You develop this habit in your family. We bring God first. We are the people that makes God first in our finances, in our tithes, in our offerings. We give freely because we had experienced the riches that comes from God. So we can give because He gave us first. And there's more. Another withholds what he should give and only suffers want. Verse 25. Whoever, say whoever. Say with me, whoever. So this includes uh, teenagers that have their allowance from their parents. Oh, I'm not in the marketplace. It doesn't matter. Whoever, whoever waters, whoever brings blessing will be enriched. And the one who waters will himself be watered. This includes housewives, moms that have their income, even though it's not the main source of income of the family. You have some sort of income. Whoever brings, whoever gives freely, he or she will experience the blessings. This is a chapter that I want to encourage you to read during this week. And again, let's make January the month that we bring God first. Let me start, invite you to stand up the last time this service, please. I want to pray for you. I want to pray for your family. Everybody, please stand up. I want to pray for your finances. I want to pray for the beginning of this year that you experience prosperity, blessings. I want you to experience abundance of water, that you experience provision and never want, never lack. Close your eyes. Father, we believe in your word. We believe that if we trust in you, we will be enriched. But whoever trusts in his own riches will fall. We want to withstand. We want to stand firm. We want to have more to give more. God, I know that that's your will for each one of us. A culture in this house to give freely. And yet, grow all the richer. It is your pleasure as a good father to see your children prospering in every way. I pray for marriages. I pray for business. I pray for workers in this place. I pray for business owners. I pray, Father, that the riches of God, 
that express your favor upon us, the crown of goodness upon our families, God. Be this brand mark upon our people here. Vine Southwest Florida Church is a prosper and rich church in order to bless even more. I want to declare this word upon each of the families represented in this place. This is a year of acceleration. We're going to see supernatural connections, bringing God prosperity in every way. Health, anointing, connections, open doors. We receive in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said, Amen. Hallelujah, Jesus. You guys can give using our digital platforms or the buckets go around. Um, I want to really you to learn. Like you have to experience the power of giving God first. Now let me, while uh, you guys are still looking to the, the ways to give. I developed this habit years ago. Like I can say the second year of my marriage. Uh, this year I'm going to be uh, 18 years married with my wife. 18th anniversary in uh, July and anyways, so I developed this habit that every year in the month of January, I will set apart this special offering. It is the first fruit offering. And I decided personally, this is my step of faith, that the measure of faith I could give, I will give that special offering. The amount of tithe I wish to give by the end of that year. In other words, if I want... By the end of 2022, to give a tithe of $800, even though today my tithe is about $600, I give myself this step of faith, and I know the Lord will prosper me that by the end of that year, I will be tithing $800. Let me say something. It works. In all these 18 years, I haven't experienced this this increasing of blessing. This bold step of faith in your giving right now in January. Say amen, everybody. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. All right. Now, today, we're following our series that we're calling Acceleration. Tell to your neighbor, Acceleration. Acceleration. This is the year of acceleration 2022 is the year that things will be speed up in your life we believe the days of small things is over but you have to understand this in the perspective of God first remember that God lives in another dimension of time God is out of time God created time and it's important you see that because if you think God is limited to our chronological time, your faith will also be limited to the chronological sense of things. God is the creator of God. He had already determined from the foundation of the world blessings upon each one of His children. Now, the way to get out of this chronological time, this timeline that we are used to imagine and see is actually getting to the dimension of faith, is always by faith. We actually were saved by faith, we walk by faith, and now we experience the, the blessings of God that is in His dimension of time by faith. Everybody says, by faith. By faith. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also... He has put eternity into man's heart, yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. The title of my message today is A Time for Everything. Say with me, a time, say a season for everything. Close your eyes. Holy Spirit, fill this room. Once again, I invite you, Holy Spirit, to bring revelation, light in our darkness. Bring us, God, to the dimension of your kairos, the timing of God 
in order for us to experience this promise acceleration in our lives, in our marriages, God, in our ministry. We want to see what could take 10 years in one's ministry happening even this year. Father, we receive this word by faith. And right now I pray that this word that we're going to receive this morning, we're going to nourish our heart to move forward in your purpose in our lives. In Jesus' name, everybody said once again, amen. Now, this craving, this desire for God's timing is nothing else than actually the desire for God's perfect will. Inside of each one of us, there is this uh, uh, design, this seed, this craving for God's perfect will. The perfect will of God is what we actually are looking for our lives. Yes, we know there is the permissible will of God. There is the sovereign will of God. In other words, even if you will or not, even if you pray or not, even if you are faithful or not, Jesus is coming back. Say amen. That's the sovereign, uh, uh, determined, addicted will of God. Willing or not will take place. But we want more than that. We want the specific, personal, perfect will of God for each one of us. Can I hear a good amen, everybody? Now, that speaks about the timing to open that business, the timing to get engaged, the timing to start leading my group, the timing to actually get out of that place where I'm working. Are you guys with me? The perfect will of God. Anybody home here wants the perfect will of God? Discerning the will of God, the moment to step forward or maybe to get out. We want the perfect will of God. Now, we know in Romans chapter 12 how we can discern the will of God. Do not be conformed, verse 2, to this world. In other words, don't take the shape, don't think like the world thinks. When everybody's thinking it is just like destruction, bad news, you don't take the shape, you don't conform your mind like the world, but be transformed, you experience metanoia, transformation from inside out by the renewal of your mind, that by testing, you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Some versions actually say, what is the good, what is the acceptable but you discern the perfect will of God. I like that version better. Now, how we discern that is when our minds are not conformed, is not taking the shape of the way the world thinks. God's timing, in God's timing, there is favor, open doors. It's like the wise that wrote Ecclesiastes chapter 3 that says, everything is beautiful in its time. Do you guys agree with me? I agree with Solomon or, or the scribe that wrote that. Everything is beautiful in its proper time. Now, God himself have determined seasons. And this is one of the most interest uh, perceptions about time we have. That was actually... Um, describe or explain to the New York Times Journal in 1929 by Albert Einstein himself, and I quote him, when you sit with the love of your life for two hours, you think it's only a minute, but when you sit on a hot stub for a minute, you think it's two hours. So it's just, the, the, he was trying to explain relatively of time, which it's not necessarily like that. It's much more complicated than that, and I can surely affirm that. Maybe you don't know this, but I'm a physicist. So it's much more complicated than that. This is our perception of how time can be relative. We, sh- we actually shared this other text in the Psalms that the psalmist says, God, one day in your courts, in your presence, is worth it a thousand any other place. And I have to agree with that. But Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 1 tells us about seasons, times 
for everything under heaven. Look what he says. Verse 1. For everything. Say with me, everything. 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 There, is un, there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. So, while we are here under heaven, everything is fleeting. It's temporary. It's transient. Which implies that this time of hardship, maybe these two years was really hard for you and your family. It took, you took that toll on your life, in your marriage, in your personal walk with God. Let me remind you, this is not permanent. Everything under heaven is transient, is temporary. Say a good amen, everybody. It's not permanent. Absolutely, everything in this world, it's only temporary. First John chapter 2, 17. And the world is passing away along with its desires. Oh yeah, desires is one of the most fleeting things we have. And we can notice this mainly when you look to the fashion industry, right? They literally created fashion for every single season. And if you are married and you're the husband, you know what I'm talking about, how hard it is to keep up with your wife's desire for the new trending, I mean, I mean, praise Jesus, let's move forward. You know, let's be happy at the end of this sermon. So, is everything fleeting? But whoever does the will of God abides forever. Say amen, everybody. Again, we, go, we, we are going back to discerning the will of God. His timing for our lives. That feeling, that eternity came in a single moment in my life. Like I'm fulfilling God's eternal purpose for my life. There's no better feeling than that. The only thing in this world that is eternal and enduring... Is the person of God Himself and His promises, His Word. So the best thing we can do to experience this craving for timing of eternity, God's timing, God's will, is seeking His kingdom first. Matthew chapter 6, Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? All these are what? Desires. Fleeting desires. Right? For the Gentiles, those that do not know God, seek after these fleeting things. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. Verse 33. But seek first. Say to your neighbor, seek first. Say it again, seek first. You see the importance of the first. These align us, these plugged us in God's will, God's perfect will. Again, you could be any other place, but you came today because you're seeking God's first. You're, you could be watching anything right now. Maybe uh, I actually uh, read this article. If today you decided to watch absolutely all the Streaming options that is available to us today in all these streaming services that you can, you know, uh, subscribe. Pay attention. Your lifespan, your lifetime, if you'll be watching 24-7, non-stop, will won't be enough to watch all the programs available. And I'm not talking old Movies, I'm talking the new programs and series developed in the past five, four years. If you stop to watch all the series that all these streaming services are providing, your lifetime will not be enough to watch it, it all. So there is this dispute in the world to get us distracted, unaware, totally lost and wasting our life. But today, you could be watching anything of these endless possibilities, but you're watching us online. 
You are here today. So you are seeking God first. You are seeking first the kingdom. And when we seek first the kingdom of God, verse 33, and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Added to me. You're going to follow to me. In other words, you're going to be living life, not seeking after these fleeting things that are just missed. They are just like a fog. When you think you grasp grasp something that has reality, it actually goes through your fingers. It doesn't have satisfaction. Verse 34, Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow. For tomorrow will be anxious for itself, sufficient for the day in its own trouble. And we all say, Amen. Like, if there's something that we cannot control or discern is what's coming tomorrow. Now, but we rest our hearts in what the Lord is giving us today. Now, let me go back to my train of thought. If the wise wrote in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, that everything under heaven, there is timing. I need to remind you again that everything changes but God. Everything in this world changes. And is in a constant change. It is in a constant transformation. Now, God does not change, but He has the power to change everything around you. That deserves a Facebook post. God does not change But God is able and He wants to change everything around you. So seasons and times change. Always following a precise divine order. After the storm, it comes the calmness. After the night, it comes the morning. After the winter, spring is coming. So we expect summer after fall. So, we expect to fall after summer. So, after every season, we have this divine order of change. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 2. The time, a time to be born and a time to die. There is a time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted. So, God is trying to teach us. That in order to harvest in the next season, I first need to sow today. You are today everything you have sown yesterday. You are the results of your yesterday decisions. You are appreciated today. Because you respected others then. You are valued today because you selfless love before. Everything you harvest now has to do with the sowing then. So the key is what we are doing right now. What are we sowing right now? And to succeed in the upcoming season... We need to focus in what we are doing now. I'm not focusing tomorrow. Tomorrow will bring its own trouble, Jesus said. I focus in what I'm doing now. So there are principles that we can apply in the now that are going to propel us. We're going to accelerate us to the next divine appointment, divine season. Now... I'm going to share these four principles, and I want you to put it in practice, not tomorrow, but right now. Are you guys with me? I don't want to leave this service today and say, that was a nice message. I think I'm going to talk about it tomorrow. No, no, no. After the service, during your lunch, you're going to be talking about these four principles. Let me hear a good amen, everybody. Because this is important. You put it in practice right now, these principles, to see the blessings, the acceleration tomorrow. Number one, again, the principle of change. If you want something different in the next season, you must change things in this current season. 
I know it sounds self-explaining, but it's important to tell you this again. If you want the next season to be different, you must adjust things now in your marriage, in your business. If you want your leadership to be different, if you're doing the same thing you did in the past season in your life group, you won't experience anything different. So someone defined, and I know this is attributed to Einstein, but it is not, that the definition of insanity is someone doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. Whoever said that, I have to agree and say amen. But you are not insane. You are not dumb. And you are expecting different things. Therefore, you do different things now. You change the way you speak with your wife. You premeditate to spend time with your children. You really want to invest money in the church in order to see prosperity. That's the way of God. So I don't want you to take this principle lightly because it is a matter of survival in our era. Researchers in the past said that for any organization to survive in the following generation, organization, church, they had to suffer a major transformation every 10-year cycle. We could see that here in the United States, mainly in the um, fast food franchise. Every other period of time, they change something. They change even the, the color of their roof. They change the color of their stores. Have you ever guys noticed this? Like, you, like I don't want to name any one of the franchise because all of them, every other time, they try to renovate the appearance, the logo, how they're going to present themselves to the generation. However, we are in a time of acceleration. And even the world noticed that, that transformation, it's a matter of survival. Actually, the word metabolism implies constant transformation. It means the sum of the physical and chemical processes in a living organism in order to maintain life. In other words, there are two types of people. Those that are being transformed and experiencing change and alive. And those that are dying. Those that are being dismissed, forgotten, dying. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Am I reading the NIV version that says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new. It's good to tell this to your neighbor. The new. Tell your, your spouse, say, the new. And show, show herself to him. Say, the new. Look at me, the new. The new is here. The new is here. It's not tomorrow. It's not yes. The new is here. So let's be honest. These are changing times. And they are, fast, they are faster than ever before. The old has gone. The new is here. Now, God had determined change in your life. And if you want to experience the blessings for this season, you have to make that step of change. Maybe create a new habit. So my challenge for you is that you turn your focus in the right direction in order to move faster. God wants to thrust you to the new. It can be committing yourself to the life group this season in a new and different manner and level. You're not only going to be a participant, an spectator, but now you actually ask your leader to be part of the schedule of the food. Maybe you're going to pray. You're going to be the intercessor and prayer in your life group. Hey, leader, count with me. I'm going to bring one visitor Every month, every month, I'm going to invest time in a family to bring to our life group. It can be committing yourself to come to the service every week. We are a church of two wings. In order for us to soar 
and move higher. We need to fly with our life groups and with our services. There is no way our church is going to move forward if we have these gaps of participation in our services. I appreciate technology that allows us to talk with people that cannot be in person. I understand there are many reasons. However, maybe this is the year you make a commitment to be a service attendant. You're going to be you're going to come over here and receive fresh food for your week, for your family. Maybe it means you reading your whole Bible, which is one of the most incoherent things we can ever uh, call ourselves. We call ourselves Christians. We call ourselves the people of the book. But you don't know your book. You know, Pastor John Wharton, he is sharing with me. And one of the reasons why people in Iran, it's getting saved and converted. is because, because of technology and access in education for women. People decided to read for the first time the Alcoran. Yeah, the book that they believe is sacred. And they are coming to a single conclusion. It is simply dumb. It doesn't make any sense. Why I was even believing such a thing? However, I dare you, if you read this book, and your life is going to be the same at the end of this year. I dare you, if you read this book, and your marriage is going to be the same at the end of this year. Are you guys with me? Yeah. Now, you have, there are so many resources. I can help you. Your leader can help you. We have the Bible in our phones. We can have the Bible reading itself for us. You have so many resources available. Please change something in order to experience the next, the new, the acceleration tomorrow. Amen. So acceleration, the definition of acceleration is actually um, difference of speed, right? So in physics, we define acceleration. This physics value, this physics uh, um, element that has to do when you change the value of your speed divided by the difference of time. You don't need to remember anything that I just said. But one thing you know, when you go to a theme park, when you fly and you, t you take uh, and you um, leave the, air uh, the airplane leaves the floor, you, you take off the thrilling the excitement, sensation, it's not related to the speed. It's not connected to the constant speed. Actually, right now, our planet is in a very high speed. But because it's a constant speed, you don't notice anything. But if we speed, if we accelerate it, if we change the speed of Earth, Oh man, we all are gonna fail. We're gonna all, we all are gonna feel earthquakes and changes that this world cannot support itself. Thrilling, excitement, the joy that the Lord has for you implies in changes. And I know there are people that resist change, resist the change of speed, but it's better you buckle up. Because God is at haste. He wants to come back. He wants to save. He wants to bring revival. So buckle up, my friend, because speed will be changing your life. Acceleration is going to happen. Look, we don't control the winds, but we definitely can control the main sail of our boat and take the wind to thrust us to the new of God. Amen. Number two. The principle of sowing. I already spoke a little bit about it, but I want to emphasize that right now. Matthew chapter 16, verse 1 to 3. And the Pharisees and Sadducees came to test Jesus, asking Him to show them a sign from heaven. And He answered them, When it's evening, you say, It will be fair weather. For the sky is red. And in the morning, you say, it will be stormy today. For the sky is red and threatening. You know how to interpret 
the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of times. So Jesus said that surprised with the Pharisees and the religious ones. He was surprised that those people were lacking discernment to discern and perceive the timing, the errors. My question is, are you conscious of the timing we are in these days? Are you aware of the current moment in your circumstances, but also around your circumstances? Ecclesiastes 3, 2, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, and a time to pluck up what is planted. Time of harvest only comes after sowing. So the miracles of abundance in the Bible always came after someone sowing something. Now pay attention. More specifically, sowing in a time of lack. So we have the widow of Zarephath, Zarephath that when Elisha came, Elijah came, she didn't have enough for herself and her son, but she sowed oil. She sowed her flour, and she had more than enough to supply for herself and her son for the rest of her life. The boy in John chapter 6 that gave his lunch to Jesus, he gave his food to Jesus. In a crowd of more than 5,000 people, there was only one boy with a lunch, with food. Maybe there were other people. But it seems that there were no much there because the, the disciples came to Jesus and said, there is not enough food. That boy sowed and 5,000 could experience multiplication. The lack of wine and someone were able to give just jars of water to Jesus was enough to bring joy again to that wedding party. I don't know about you. Maybe we're expecting another moment to sow, another moment to make this powerful sowing in your life, in your ministry, in your finances. But maybe the lack, maybe the need, maybe this moment that you look around and say, I can't, should be exactly the time you should sow. Every seed follows a process to flourish, but in timing, in times of acceleration, God shortens time. Let me prove that to you. This is the verse we are studying, we are meditating, we are prophesying over our families in our ear. Amos chapter 9, verse 13. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when the plowman, the plowman shall overtake the reaper. And the trader of grapes will overtake who sows the seed. Yes. So the, the plowman and the reaper will be together. The one that is selling the grapes and making wine. He's going to overtake the one that is sowing the seed. The mountains shall drip sweet wine. And all the hills shall flow with it. So, let me try to encourage you once again. This is a very special season for sowing because we are living a prophetic time of acceleration. If you want to see multiplication, if you want to see increase, if you want to see your chart, your graphics of your investments going higher in a short period of time, can I dare to tell you as your pastor and a prophet in this house? This is a time for investment. This is a time for sowing big. Number three, the principle of preparation. Now, everything change, every change will be resistant. And every change has the, uh, the demand for sowing before. So laziness, tardiness 
fatigue, are these enemies that conspire against the new of God. They are resistance, trying against our acceleration. It's just like trying to hold us back with intimidation of the things of the past. I already tried, Pastor. I've been praying for this for years. Anxiety, fear, whatever it is, there is this feeling that maybe you're not going to work again. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 5. A time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. Now, one of the subjects I'm studying in my master's is hermeneutics. It's just the techniques to approach a Bible text and learn just what the text is saying without going beyond what the text is talking about it. A very simple principle we use in hermeneutics is just read the text in its own context. And you're probably going to find everything you need to understand it. So, in the context, casting away stones and gathering stones is related to peace and refrain from peace, pushing away someone, speaking about of wartime. So the verse implies that you should prepare the soil for what is up to come upon that soil. For example, if you are a farmer, you don't want to see stones in the soil. You want to take away, cast away the stones from the ground. You want to prepare the soil before the seeds come. Are you guys with me? However, if you are in a war and you don't want your enemy to get close to your territory, what do you do? You actually throw a lot of stones in the soil to make difficult to the enemy approach you. That's actually in the old-fashioned war style not without drones. That's how it happened. In times of war, the people will gather big stones and throw it into the soil, in the terrain, to create that hard access into the area. Are you guys with me? So, times of battle is time to throw with stones. Someone said that not preparing is the same as being prepared to fail. On the day of battle, you will not have time to prepare. In a time of harvest, your seeds should be sowed, planted months ago. You should not miss the timing. Another person said that more sweat in preparation is less blood in the field. So we are called to be prepared all the time. All the time. This is David trying to convince the afraid, frightened Saul that he was prepared to kill Goliath the giant. And how did David convince Saul? 1 Samuel chapter 17. He said, verse 37, The Lord who delivered me, I'm verse 37, from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said, said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. Hey, Saul, I am prepared because in the past years, I had to face a lion. I had to face a bear. And now I am prepared for the next glory the Lord prepared for me. Tribulations, trials, these giants, this apparent resistance are just invitations for an increase of glory in your marriage. An increase of glory in your ministry. Marriage that resist the temptation of divorce have greater glory. Parents that still love despite the rejection has a measure of glory that other parents don't have. 
Single people that keep themselves holy to the altar have a measure of glory that others don't have. So, I believe that one of the signs of God's favor upon Vine Southwest Florida Church is that God gave us many opportunities of being prepared, ready for the next season. And you know what is the season we are in right now? Preparation season. We're still in preparation. We're still being prepared for the next season to come. Yes, there is a measure of glory in the current season. But in this current season, I still being prepared. Amen. Ephesians 5, 15. Look carefully then, how you walk not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Say amen. amen. No, I'm trying to make the best use of time. So can I ask you for 10 more minutes? All right, thank you. Very few amen, but... I'm, I'm, I'm trying my best. I'm trying my best. But are you guys receiving anything this morning? Yeah. I am. I am receiving. Verse 17. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery. But be filled with the Spirit. Here's the second practical way for us to discern the will of God. Be filled with the Spirit. Be always prepared in season and out of season. Create disciplines and new habits of being filled with the Spirit. Wake up in the morning, not with your alarm, but with a worship song. Instead of the picture of your wife or your kids, put a Bible verse in your front of your phone. Just create new habits that are going to promote you always be filled with the Spirit. Prepare you always. Someone define success like this. Success is the place where preparation and opportunities meet. Therefore, opportunities always exist. And they move from hand to hand, but they always end up in the hands of those who were prepared in that season. So yesterday, I don't know by chance, it came up in that suggested videos uh, that you, you, know, you have in YouTube. And it was this like chart with the most rich people in the uh, end of the 20th century and the beginning of the 21st century. It is unbelievable how that chart, chart moved so fast. Sometimes Bill Gates were in the top. Now we have Jeff Bezos. And there's always this change of riches, uh, uh, the change of hands where it reaches is hold on. Preparation is to do the small things consistently in the current season, even in, when it seems not useful, but your future will thank you. Which definitely begs the question, what are you doing right now that your future will thank you? What are the things you are preparing right now that your future will be grateful for that? So it's like the tale of the little girl that after seeing his, her church praying for rain, could not come to the service without umbrella, but she was impressed that nobody carried umbrella. They prayed for, but they did not prepare for. Last principle. That's where your extra time is going to come in. Are you guys ready? Four and last principle. Principle of perseverance. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 have about 28 different times, different seasons. It depends how you read it, but you're going to find about 28 of them. In all of them, you're going to find beginning and end of seasons. However, you will find no time to surrender. No time to give up. You cannot find any good time to go backward. The Bible never encourages us to give up. On the contrary. Galatians 6 verse 9. And let us not grow weary 
of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. Say to your neighbor, do not give up. Say to somebody else that was just not looking to your face now, say, do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially those who are of the household of faith. In other words, do good at least for the people that loves you back, which is the church. Which is crazy, right? We need to give such a direction. Because Jesus said in the opening of the gospel in Matthew chapter 5 to 7 in the Sermon on the Mount that if you love those that loves you, you're doing nothing different than the world does. But in our days, and it seems in Paul's day, we need to remind this, like even those that do good for you, love them back at least, you know. But it's crazy because we live in a, in a time that people really think that even the good they receive, there's some sort of agenda behind. I have one agenda. I want your success. I want to see you thriving in your marriage. I want to see you prosper. I want you to see you as an overcomer. We want, this is the passion, this is the burden of this house, to build up a church of overcomers, which you are called to be. Say amen, everybody. So if one expects success in the future, one must be perseverant. I'm going to quote a phrase that I read to prepare this message by Theodore Roosevelt, Jr., the 26th president of the United States. And he said, you go ahead. Yes, you go ahead and sit back in your comfortable chair. And you, you'll be the critic. You'll be the observer. While the brave one gets in the ring and engages. And gets bloody and gets dirty and fails. Over and over and over again. But yet, isn't afraid and isn't timid and lives life in a bold way. We are church call to never give up. There is a harvest to come, a time of blessing. But in order to enter that acceleration time, we cannot give up, everybody. We cannot give up. Let me invite you to stand up. And I know that for a word like that, like I said, you can't put in practice right now. But I want to speak specifically for those that were thinking on giving up. I want to pray for you. Because we barely start the year. And some of you guys were thinking on giving up on your leadership. You were thinking on giving up on your ministry. You were thinking on giving up on your family. You said that will be the last Christmas I'm going to try in this marriage. And it seemed to be very similar to the past years. And now these are going to be the last New Year's Eve, that I'm going to go with this person. And you were really planning on giving up. I want to speak to you. I want to give you an opportunity right now to, to say, God, I need your strength. I need your calling fresh again in my heart. God, this is, I'm receiving these promises. You are speaking through the pastor, through the church. I can see things moving forward. But God, I want to see the ch these changes, these transformations taking place in my life as well. If that's your desire, would you respond, God, right now? Just, just say, God, I don't want to give up. God, I don't want to step backwards. I don't want to give up. God, I don't want to backwards. No, now finally we have space for you to move around and maybe respond, God, in an in a altar call, old-fashioned way. Just stepping forward and say, God, I don't want to give up. I'm committing myself to your calling, your calling. It's not me calling myself. It is you calling me. Would you just step forward, maybe taking, getting out of your seat, maybe coming to the front, of maybe coming to the aisles, 
doesn't matter where you're going to head, but just do an act of someone responding, God, I don't want to give up. I really don't want to give up, God. Come on, come forward. We have space now enough for you to move forward. Let me bless you. Let me lay my hands over your life, Pastor Tulio, uh, any disciple in the house that is here. I want to bless you right now. Father, we are your church. A church to be an overcomer. A church, God, call to see transformation taking place. Transformation as a lifestyle, God. We are your people expecting to see the fruits of the sowing of our seeds. That's why we keep sowing. That's why we keep planting. That's why we keep dipping our roots in you, God. Father, we are a church that prepares, that gets ready for the next season. We don't want to wait until it happens. We make it happen by faith, by faith. That's why, God, today we want to commit ourselves again to not give up. We want to commit ourselves again to not give up in our marriage, in our ministry, in our parenting. I don't know what the Holy Spirit is speaking to you, but I feel people here even giving up on their own lives, on their own lives. I want to rebuke the spirit of suicide among us. People that was thinking on taking their own lives, I want to cast out every thought of death, every thought of taking your own life right now. You are belonged. You are dear. You are chosen. The Lord has chosen you. You will have a different year. You're going to experience the favor, the goodness of God upon your life. The Lord is accelerating times in your life. 